So welcome everyone to meet the social side of your architecture. And the reason I want to do this talk is because I found that we as an industry, we often talk about the importance of teamwork, the power of team autonomy, but I've also seen that those things are notoriously hard to get right. And when we fail, we tend to fail miserably. So in this session, we're going to approach software development from the people side, from the side of social psychology. And you might very well ask yourselves, why do I, as a software developer, feel qualified to talk about this? Why do I feel qualified to talk about psychology? Well, my background is a little bit different. I've been in the software industry for uh, more than 20 years, but also have a slightly different background. I also have a degree in psychology, which happens to be one of my big, big interests. And what I do these days is that I try to take my psychological perspective and apply it to my technical work. And I've written two books about it, Your Code is a Crime Scene and my most recent book, Software Design X-Rays. So we're going to talk about a lot of psychology today as well as software architecture. And I actually like to start with a controversy. Because when I studied psychology, one of the most fascinating things I came across was within the field of personality psychology. And the reason I got interested by this was that some of you might have done a personality test, maybe as part of a recruitment, right? So you do a personality test and you, you, know, you get to score in different dimensions, like are you introverted, are you extroverted, or how open are you to new experiences, things like that. And there's one group of psychologists that claim that personality is really, really important to measure because it can kind of predict how we will act and how we will behave right? Kind of makes sense. That's, that's why we do these tests, right? But then there's a different group of psychologists who claim that personality really isn't that important. And the reason it isn't that important is because the situation, right, the context where we work and live is so much more complicated. So the social forces and the situational forces will dominate any personality traits. And the first time I heard about this controversy, I was like, wow, I've seen this before. This is static versus dynamic typing, right? This is uh, Emacs versus Vim. It's, it's almost like this tendency towards controversy and strong opinions. It's a human thing. Who knew? But of course, like all strong controversies, the truth is somewhere in the middle. And but with a strong tendency towards uh, giving weight to the situation. Because it turns out that 91% of the differences in people's behavior in different situations can just not be accounted to by personality tests. A personality is still important because it kind of predisposes us to act in a certain way, but the way we will act is mostly determined by the situation. And the reason I share this with you is because this has influenced how I view software systems. To me, a software system has both a personality as well as situational forces. And to me, the architecture, the way the system looks today, that's the system's personality. And just like a personality for a person, our system's personality, our architecture, kind of predisposes what we can do with the system. It determines if something will be easy or hard to modify an ad. But I like to put weight on the people and organizational side, the situational forces. Because if we get that one right, then we can succeed no matter what our architecture looks like. Right with the right people, the right organization, we will succeed. It might be challenging, it might be inefficient, but we will succeed. If we get the people side wrong, we will fail no matter how good our technical architecture is. And this is something that affects us all the time. And I'd like to share a story about something that happened to me almost 10 years ago. So this is a story about a company. And it's a company that were in a very, very good position. They were in a good position because they had a successful product in the market. That product was almost 10 years old, had generated a lot of cash for them. And what they needed to do now was to modernize it. So they decided to re-implement the system from scratch. And they were in a good position because they had very detailed historical data. It kind of showed them that, you know, re-implementing this system on a modern platform will take our five in-house developers roughly one year. 
I know, I know what you think right now. A software project that's predictable. Crazy, right? And of course, someone from marketing came down and said, you know, one year to implement a new system, uh, that's not good enough. We have this important trade show in just three months. Can't we do this in three months? How do you take something that you know will take one year and compress it down to just three months? Easy. You just throw four times the number of people on it. And they did. So they hired 25 software consultants in addition to the five in-house people and let them loose on the software architecture. The software architecture was already set with the original developers in mind. I wasn't part of the project from the beginning. I came in later for, how should I put it, the post-mortem, because this project didn't finish in uh, three months. In fact, it didn't finish in one year either. So I analyzed the system and I interviewed a lot of the people. And one recurring theme in those interviews was that everyone was claiming that that code was so hard to understand. And this kind of surprised me because I've been reviewing the code and I mean, it wasn't perfect in any sense of the word, but it was pretty good. But then it occurred to me that the reason that code is hard to understand is because of this. Because as software developers, we never remember the details of the code, right? What we remember instead is a mental model, an imperfect high-level abstraction of what the actual code looks like. And when you have lots of people working on a project, when you're overstaffed, like this particular project, what tends to happen is that even if you write a piece of code yourself today, then three days later, it might look completely different because you had five other developers working in the meantime. So it makes it impossible to maintain a stable mental model. And this is one of the reasons why code might be perceived as hard to understand. It's also a frequent source of defects and delays. And this shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who has read The Mythical Man Month. So The Mythical Man Month is one of those classic books and it's perhaps best known for what we now call Brooks Law. And Brooks Law states that adding more people to a late software project makes it even later. And Brooks even has a formula where he explains this. And I've tried to visualize Brooks' formula. Here it is. So what you see on the x-axis is the number of people we can add to the project. And what you see on the y-axis is the number of months to completion. And what we can see here is that to a certain degree, we can add more people to the project and we get a shorter completion date. But at some point, the coordination costs of adding more people tend to outweigh the extra hours we get available by adding more people. So that completion time pushes away further in the future. It simply takes longer and longer to implement new stuff and get done. And according to Brooks, the main reasons for uh, Brooks' law is due to the increase in coordination and communication overhead when adding many people. But I like to claim that there are other factors as well. There are also what I like to call soft risks with overstaffing. And these are mainly motivational factors. So what tends to happen on overstaffed projects is that you get exposed to something called social loafing. So social loafing is a motivational loss. It's known from social psychology. It's a well-studied phenom phenomenon. And uh, it's something that happens when we feel that the success of our team depends very little on our own actual efforts. So what tends to happen in social loafing is that, you know, we pretend to do our work. We sit there and try to look busy. But... At the end, we're really just trying to keep up the appearance and hope that our peer peers will keep up the actual effort. And it sounds horrible, but it's actually a very, very human thing. And social loafing is something that happens when we feel that the goals of a particular project, maybe they are not clearly communicated, or maybe arbitrary deadlines were enforced upon us. When that happens, people lose motivation in a task. And it simply becomes harder in a lot of projects to see how my individual contributions make a difference, right? 
So why do we keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again? Why do we keep falling into the trap described by Brooke's law? I think I can explain that to you. And I'd like you to take a look at this small piece of code here, which is part of a much larger module. When looking at that code, can anyone tell me if this code is a coordination bottleneck for our five different development teams, or if it's code written by just a single individual so that we have a key personal risk? We just cannot tell, right? Looking at the source code, there's no way of answering those questions. And this is something I like to call the great tragedy of software design, that we, the people, the organization that build the system, we are invisible in the code itself. And this means that quite often we tend to downplay the importance of the social side of code, and we start to treat symptoms instead of the real issues. So if you ever worked on a project where you've seen some of these symptoms, things like frequent and complicated merge conflicts, you know, unexpected feature interactions leading to tricky bugs, or maybe have very long-lived feature branches. I like to claim that each one of those symptoms, the real root cause is always an organizational issue. And to truly improve, we need to uncover those issues. So where do we start? How can we uncover the social side of a code? Well, the first thing I would like to do is to find a way to detect if we have some coordination bottlenecks in the code due to the way we work with it as an organization. And the metric I'm going to use is something that's called fractal figures. Here's what they look like. So let me walk you through this visualization. What you do here is that you take each architectural building block, it could be a service, it could be a layer, it could be a component, and then you represent it as a box. And then you look at which teams have contributed to that code. And the more each team has contributed, the larger their area of the box. And each team is represented by a distinct color. So at the bottom of this page, I have a reference to uh, the research paper that explains all of this. There's actually a formula in the paper. I won't spend much time on this formula. But the reason I'm presenting it is because visualizations are great for inspections. But to be able to kind of compare different patterns, to compare different findings, we need to normalize. We need to take these visualizations and normalize it to a number. So that formula, basically all you need to know about it is that you can take the amount of fragmentation, the contributions from different teams, and calculate what's called a fractal value. A fractal value, you see it in the bottom left corner, is just a number, right? So zero means that all the code in this component is written by the same team. There's no additional coordination with other teams. And the closer to one we get, the more fragmented the development efforts, the more different teams do we have contributing in that code. So I hope I managed to clarify that. The next challenge, now that we have a way of visualizing and measuring this, is to find out where do we get that data? How do we know which team that has written the code? Those of you who attended my session yesterday, you know that I'm a big fan of version control data. And I'm a big fan of version control data because version control data is social data. We know from our version control which developer that has written which piece of code, and we know when they did it. So what I do is simply I take the individual contributions and then I aggregate them depending on which team each developer belongs to, and I sum it up and I get the total amount of code contributed by each team. The limitation of version control data is that it's very file-centric, right? So you look at Git or a subversion, and it basically manages files. But the interesting unit of analysis for us is the architectural level. So just like I aggregate individuals into teams, I also aggregate individual files into architectural building blocks. So I just take all contributions to a particular uh, directory with, that might represent a component or multiple directories, and I aggregate the contributions so that I can visualize fractal figures on an architectural level. All right, I'm going to show you some examples on how you actually use this, and I think that will clarify a lot. Because armed with the fractal figures and a fractal value, we can start to identify some social ways to fail with software. 
And what I want to do now is to present a few different architectures and see how they typically hold up when worked on by different organizations. And I'd like to start with one of the classics. Is this something you recognize? Yeah, I think so, right? This is the classic model view controller pattern. But if you've ever seen a model view controller implemented, you know that this is never ever what it looks like in a backend. Because we know that we need to have some kind of services layer. And we often need to have a repository layer. Why do we need a repository? Well, I've been writing code for almost 30 years, and I have to admit that I still haven't found a good reason for a repository. But let's just skip that and call it the best practice so I don't have to motivate it. And then, of course, we want an object relational mapper because we don't necessarily want to deal with SQL directly. But of course, we would need one more layer, right? We need a data abstraction layer because otherwise we don't get to use those really cool mock frameworks to write unit tests. And then, of course, it's always good to have a business layer, right? So we can express some business capabilities here, and we might have new models and whatnot. So in re reality, you will often find 9, 10, 11 different layers. Now, given the view to the right here, I like to ask, what's the cost of change? What happens if we want to add something to this architecture? Let's say we want to add something to the system, maybe just a checkbox that the user can take to persist those specific option. What would that code modification look like? It would look like this. It would ripple through the entire architecture, and we would have to do a small predictable change to each one of those layers. And it turns out that I have a lot of data on this. I've studied this on real systems. And I have found that in a layered architecture like this, somewhere between 30 to 70% of all permits modify multiple layers. And I find it fascinating because uh, one of the motivations behind the layered architectures is a separation of concerns. But to me, given this data, it looks like with layers, it might be the wrong concerns that we're separating. Them. And this is visible if you look at the layered architecture using fractal values. So in the visualization to the right, you see those circles. This is the same visualization style as I used in my session yesterday when I talked about technical depth. And for those of you who weren't in the session, each one of those large circles it simply represents all the code for a specific subsystem. And the larger the circle, the more code we have in that subsystem or that component. And the color is the fractal value. You know, how much fragmentation do we have between different teams? And the closer to one we get, the maximum fragmentation, the more red the corresponding circle. And I can then uh, have a look at one of those components and see the fragmentation and coordination between different teams. And we see in a layer, layered architecture, everything tends to become a coordination bottleneck. And this is the reason I get for one of the most frequent questions I ever get. And that question is, should we use component or should we use feature teams? We kind of tried both, and none of them really seems to work. The reason for this is because if you have a layered architecture and you put component teams on it, so you might have things like one team responsible for each layer, things like that. So you have a database team, an application team, or UI team. What tends to happen is that you get really, really long lead times because you need to coordinate in each one of those interfaces to do a handover to the next team. So you tend to get very long lead times. So it's tempting to switch to a feature team that can kind of work across the whole stack. And what tends to happen then is that your whole architecture becomes a gigantic coordination bottleneck because you now have multiple teams working the same parts of the code, but for different reasons since they work on different features. So I actually think that the only good answer I've found to these questions, component teams or feature teams in a layered architecture is this one. It's a quote from one of my favorite childhood movies, War Games where the only winning move is not to play. Because we cannot fix what is fundamental on architectural issue by purely organizational changes. An architecture and organization always need to evolve together. And I think this failure of layers to, um, to, to easily accommodate multiple teams 
is one of the reasons for the popularity behind microservices. So microservices have been incredibly popular over the past five years. And when I talk to organizations that adopt microservices, they often claim three different benefits that they expect from microservices. The first one is that uh, the organization expects the microservice architects architecture to be loosely coupled. Because by having loosely coupled microservices, they can provide autonomous teams where each team can take full responsibility for one service and evolve it. And by doing that, they gain a number of benefits. They can deploy services independently, which can help shorten lead times, but they can also scale services independently, right? So a lot of interesting benefits here. Over the past five years, I've analyzed lots of different microservice architectures, and I'd like to share some of the findings here and see how well they hold up to the expectations. The first one is something I noticed, I think I saw this uh, two years ago. It's real data, but I kind of changed the names a little bit to keep it anonymous. But we see the same thing here. Now, each one of those circles you're right is a microservice. And you cannot see that here, but each one of those uh, circles, they represent a lot of code. Each one of those services might be 20 to 30 to 40,000 lines of code. So pretty big services, right? Not so micro. And we see that a lot of them are red. And the reason they are red is because they have a high degree of, of uh, team coordination in them, a high fractal value, lots of team fragmentation. And you see an example to the left and the contribution patterns between different teams within the same service. And when I saw this the first time, um, it's, it's kind of obvious that you don't have any, any kind of team autonomy or uh, independence between the services here. And I think you can see the reason for that in the names of those services. So you have things like access control server, transaction server. And to me, that doesn't really sound like yeah, good service boundaries. So what we have here is, I would say, a failure because the architecture is technically oriented. We have lots of technical building blocks, right? Transaction server, diagnostic server. And that technical partitioning kind of misaligns with the work of the team, which tend to be feature and use case oriented. So when I work on a new feature in my team, we need to modify multiple different services because the actual business scenario is distributed across the technical building blocks. So this failure of aligning the architecture with the way we work with it kind of leads to, first of all, we can't get a thing like team, team autonomy. We cannot have a team work independently from the others because they all will have to coordinate just like they had to do in the layered architectures. And the reason they cannot do that is because we don't have any loose coupling between the services. They are tightly coupled by necessity when we choose technical building blocks as service boundaries. And as a consequence of that, we cannot lose all the potential advantages of a microservice architecture. We cannot scale services independently, and we definitely cannot deploy them independently because they all depend on each other. So, like I said, each one of those uh, circles representing a service, they're pretty big in reality. So 20, 30, 1,000 lines of code. So again, one can claim that's not so micro. So maybe this is a failure due to lack of modularity. Maybe small and modular services will solve the problem. Before I discuss that, I'd like to talk a little bit about complexity and then we do it together. Because to me, complexity comes in two different shapes. In particular, accidental complexity, the parts of the problem we're trying to solve, the way we solve the problem, that's the accidental complexity. And the first type of complexity is when we have complex parts. So this kind of complexity, I talked about in a session on technical depth yesterday, we pick up a piece of code and it's incredibly complicated and implemented, right? Deep the logic, low cohesion, all that stuff. But then there's an other kind of complexity where each piece of code is easy enough to understand in isolation, but the emerging system behavior is anything but simple. The complexity is still there, only now it's distributed in the interconnection between the different parts, between the different services. So how can we highlight things like complex interdependencies between different services or different uh, layers or components? One way of doing that is by using something I call change coupling, 
This is something I cover in the Software Design X race at length as well. Here, I just want to give you a simple example because change coupling is very different from the way we typically talk about complexity. Because change coupling is something that can only be measured from the evolution of your code, from version control data, from behavioral data. So we have a simple system here consisting of just three services to the left. And the first time we make a change to that system, we're modifying the subscription service and the sign-up service together. The next time we modify something, we touch another service. And then the third time, we're back to modifying the subscription service and sign-up service together. Now, if this is something that continues, we know that we have a logical relationship between the subscription service and the sign-up service, because they're always co-evolving like this. And this is something we can use to measure and visualize the cost of change in our architecture. I'd like to show you another example. This is again real data from a real microservice system. And I did a change capturing analysis of it and I visualized it in this way. So each one of the labels that you see around that uh, graph represents a microservice. The real visualization is interactive, so I can hover over one of the services and then I see its dependence light up, the other services with strong change capturing. And the first example we see here is uh, that if we modify a service called estimated conversions, we have seven other services that need to be modified as well. That's some tight cut one, isn't it? And just to show you that this isn't a flu, to the right, you see another service, estimated profit. Change that one and you have to modify five other services. And this tight coupling leads to what I would like to call the change coupling bond, which has dressed dramatic consequences for how we can work and organize as a team when working with this kind of architecture. So here's the team perspective. Again, same visualization style. Uh, each circle represents a service and the color represents the team fragmentation, the team coordination. And we see here that even though this, these are small, small services, right? You, again, you cannot see it from the visualization, but if you look at the data, you see that each service here is maybe 1,000, 2,000 lines of code, so really, really small services. And yet, we have this incredible coordination amongst different teams. Multiple teams work in the same service. How can that be now that we have small, simple services? Well, again, I think the answer is uh, in the name of those services. If you look at them, you see that they have names like subscription costs, payment accepted, payment received. And those would be pretty good names for an object. But they're not serving as well as service boundaries. So what I would like to claim here is that, again, we haven't found the right boundaries. What we have here is not so much different services as distributed objects. And as a consequence of that, we will have, again, very tightly coupled services, meaning that we just cannot get any true team autonomy. We cannot get teams to work independent. They will have to coordinate their changes in the code. And as a consequence of that, again, we are not benefiting from any of the promises and expectations on a microservice architecture. Now, of course, you could claim that what I have presented so far is not so much microservices as microservices, right? And that's kind of my point because microservices are incredibly hard to get right. And when we design a microservice architecture, we're also doing social design. And if we forget that, everything is lost. So let me try to move to the solutions part and, give me, and let me share some kind of the tips on what I've seen works well in practice to address these potential problems. And I would like to start this by actually referencing Conway's law, right? That the way we are organized influences the kind of architecture we design. And Conway's law, what's important to me in Conway's law is that Conway's law is about modularity. But modularity alone doesn't guarantee a successful software architecture that we just saw in the last microservice example here. What I have found is that when we managed to align our architecture with the problem domain, you know, the business problems we are trying to solve. We managed to take those business problems and express them as architectural building blocks. Then we also, as a 
almost perfect side effect create natural team boundaries. And to me, this is the core of successful software architecture. So is it possible with microservices to um, align each service with the problem domain? Yes, definitely. I've seen teams and organizations be very successful in that. But what I like to point out is it's not a guarantee. Microservices won't in any magical way cure our dependency blues. In fact, I would claim that it's harder to manage dependencies in a microservice architecture than it would be in a traditional monolith. And microservices is also an expensive and high discipline architecture. So it's still up to us to identify the proper service boundaries based on concept from the problem domain. What I've seen work well in practice is that each service is team sized and they're partitioned by business capabilities, not data, not technical responsibilities. And I've also seen, I mean, this is like the turn of question, how large should a microservice be? And I think it should be as large as the problem requires. What I think is important is that the services are kept the uh, team size so that you can have a small team work on it. And with a small team, I mean three, maximum four people. Because with three to four people, you more or less minimize any excess coordination overhead, right? You don't even need a development process because you're just three people. And uh, you also minimize those motivational biases I talked about earlier. You minimize the risk for social loafing because with three to four people, it's very, very easy to agree upon the shared goals, the shared principles, and also to see how your work has an impact on the outcome of the endeavor. But of course, not everyone is doing microservices. Myself, for example, I'm working on a system that um, is more of a traditional monolithic architecture right now. And of course, you can um, align that kind of system with the problem domain as well. And there are multiple ways of doing that. I just want to show you one example here. This is a pattern I've seen successfully applied multiple times. It's a pattern called package by component. There's a fantastic write-up referenced at the bottom of this slide. It's a write-up by Simon Brown. I highly recommend it. And the idea here is that instead of, you know, slicing our uh, architecture into different technical layers, we identify the business capabilities and we package the code according to business capabilities. And by doing so, we will again create natural boundaries for the teams. However, in a monolithic architecture, there's one piece that you need to put extra care on, and that is the database. I like to view the database like it's, it's almost like a black hole of maintenance efforts and change capping, right? It just tends to drag multiple teams in. It's of course possible to uh, share a database and avoid the different coordination needs. But it's a trade-off because I personally, I prefer to use databases for what they are good at. You know, searching, sorting, merging data, stuff like that. However, if in my architectural context, a principle like loose dependencies between different building blocks is more important, then what I might have to do is I might have to take some of the responsibilities from the database and pull them up to the application code and encapsulate them there. It's all a trade-off. It's doable, but I really recommend that you put extra care and reviews into making sure the database doesn't evolve with coordination bond. One of the, what I think are the main benefits of that package by component is that it gives you a consistent macro architecture. Everything is a business capabilities. Your top level design elements are business capabilities, but it gives you freedom to provide different implementations of those building blocks. So you might, for example, see that uh, one particular building block representing one business capability, it might be a little bit more complex. So you might see that, all right, we could really benefit from a bit more technical structure in this component. So let's introduce layers here. Then you might have another business capability that's really, really simple. You might, in fact, not even need a database. So why not implement it as a single file? And this is a big advantage because one of the reasons I don't really like layered architectures is because it kind of enforces the same architectural style on all features, right? No matter if the features are simple or complex. You know, adding a single checkbox to user interface should be ridiculously simple. 
right? And there's no reason to enforce the same change patterns on that simple change as a more elaborate and complex feature. And uh, in my view, package per component kind of gives you the best of two possible worlds. And in particular, when we look at the package by component architecture from the perspective of the team, if we identify the right business capabilities, then those will serve as natural lines for the different teams. It kind of helps you align your architecture and your organization by creating natural team boundaries. Now, I hope you found this interesting because we can actually evaluate the architectures using the kind of data I've shown you. So how can you collect that data? Well, you need tooling support on top of the raw data because it's kind of quite complex to accumulate and calculate these different numbers. So in my book, Software Design X-Rays, I have several examples on how you can mine data with Git. And in the session yesterday, I gave another example, right? But this one's a little bit different. You can use Git short log and pass it the minus S flag, and then you can specify a path to a particular component or directory representing a component. And by doing so, you will see the contributions for each developer. And then you can easily write some scripting on top of that to kind of uh, group them into teams and calculate the fractal value. Then there are tools that can actually do this for you. One of the tools is an open source project I released many years ago called the CodeMat. So CodeMat is a command line tool that takes Git data and can kind of calculate fractal values and fractal figures for you. It's available for free on my GitHub account. If you want to get serious on this and actually start to evaluate things like uh, complex microservice architectures, then I recommend that you take a look at CodeScene, which is where I do most of my work these days. So CodeScene is the evolution and the next generation of these kind of tools. And it comes with the visualizations and all of that out of the box. So please have a look at CodeScene if you're interested in this and consider to support it. Now, I still have a couple of minutes left before I'm going to take questions. So I want to take this opportunity and claim that Conway's Law, we often hear about it at software conferences, but Conway's Law is actually an oversimplification. Because when we take Conway's Law to the extreme and isolate the different teams too well, where we minimize their interaction too much, then we run into other problems. And those problems are social in their nature. More specifically, we run the risk of running into the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error is when we attribute the same observable behavior to different factors, depending on whether it concerns our team or another team. So just to give you an example, let's say that um, your team breaks the nightly bill. Yeah, I know, I know, this is a highly hypothetical scenario, right? But please pay along. So your team, breaks the nightly bill. You know that was because um, that nightly bill, you know, it has never really been that stable to start with. And besides, you were under tremendous pressure to deliver a specific feature, right? And you really did, did your best and showed your commitment, right? So a lot of uh, situational factors that explain why you broke the bill. But you also know that when my team breaks the bill, you know it's because we are a bunch of careless, cowboy hackers, right? So that's our personality, suddenly. And this is the key in the fundamental attribution error, that we overestimate personality factors when explaining the actions of others. And as you have seen in this session, I kind of like to visualize things. So I try to visualize the fundamental attribution error in software development. And this is the best visualization I came up with. I do think it kind of captures the essence here. But it leaves us with a challenge, because what this means is that, yes, we do want to, to a certain degree, keep the teams independent. We do want them to minimize their coordination needs, but at the same time, we kind of need to get some bridge between them. And that sounds a little bit like a contradiction, but it's only a contradiction because we fail to distinguish between operational boundaries and knowledge boundaries of the teams. So let me show you how I typically approach this. I like to keep the operational boundaries of software teams small. And operational boundaries are the parts of the code that we as a team are responsible for, where we do most of our work. That should typically be small and well-defined. However, our knowledge boundaries, the parts of the code that we are familiar with, the other teams that we know as persons, should be much, much wider 
and include all the subsystems, all the components, all the services that we need to interact with. And there are several ways of making this happen. One thing is to simply invite people from other teams to your code reviews. Make that a habit. You get a valuable different perspective and you get to know them as persons which minimizes the risk for the fundamental attribution error. Another thing that I always try to do is to encourage people to rotate teams. You shouldn't enforce it, but if someone wants to work on a different team, please let them do that. Make it a habit. Finally, what I also seen work well at scale is to adopt an, kind of an open source ownership model where each team are responsible for a particular a building block. They are the ones who own it. They're responsible for the quality of that code. But anyone can make contributions to it. And if that, those contributions are good enough, then uh, we're going to accept them and merge that change. And this kind of gives us the best of two different uh, options, right? Because if the team is busy, the team owning a piece of code is too busy to implement something that you need, then you can do it yourself and you do a good enough job and it's going to be included and you become familiar with another piece of code. So this has been a session where we've been covering a lot of different topics. I want to wrap it up by claiming that there's no such thing as a good or bad architecture in isolation, not even layers. An architecture is good when it supports the changes we want to make to a system and when it fits our context. And the key of this uh, session is that an architecture never ever exists in a technical vacuum. As we have seen, the social side of your code will impact so many important aspects. And what I would like to show you today was that we can actually measure that social side of code and make decisions, organizational decisions, architectural decisions based on data. And if you want to dive deeper into this topic, I have a lot of material on this in Software Design X-Rays. And I have my uh, blog, my company blog, my personal blog with different case studies and examples. And of course, I also have some interactive analysis if you want to take a look at them inside CodeSync and see what these different communication and coordination graphs actually look like. So I'm going to leave a little bit of time for questions. And I also want to take this opportunity to say thanks a lot for listening to me and may the code be with you. Thank you. Hey, uh, Adam, I think that was a fantastic session. Uh, there are a few questions. Uh, I think we have time to uh, take a few questions right now. Yeah, sure. Should I? Sure. Call out the question. Okay. So the first one is, uh, can we share people by multiple feature teams like DBA, DevOps, membership, etc.? I mean, uh, th then it's not really a feature team, right? If you have, um, uh, I'm struggling a little bit with it because um, it would typically mean that uh, there is a cross layer of uh, teams as well that might also become uh, coordination bottlenecks. Uh, so uh, if you refer to the tooling, the tooling doesn't support having a person in uh, multiple different teams. But you could, of course, uh, try it out with different uh, configurations and different definitions of the team. But what I would do is I would consider cross-functional uh, support like DevOps, for example, if you have that, or testers as a separate team. Cool. So there's another one. I think we still have some time. What kind of reflection or decisions have you seen uh, these kind of code analytics enabling most frequently in your experience? So it's uh, it's fascinating because it's uh, it's often a technical uh, action that's the result. It might simply be that you find that you have, a, particularly in microservice context, I've often seen that you use this kind of data to identify services that actually belong together. So we might collapse different services together. You might also occasionally see that uh, the reason a particular service or a building block becomes a coordination magnet is because it does way too many things. So you can use this data and get insights into that. And the result that I've seen is that the uh, services and components also tend to get split to find that better alignment. And I think the key here is that we also need to follow up on those changes and measure and see that you actually get the expected benefit. Hope I managed to answer that question. Yeah. Okay, and last one. Uh, when you refer to broad knowledge boundaries with limited operational boundaries, could you help understand the term knowledge boundary? 
would it mean that we have to heavily rely on one team per operational boundary? So what I've seen work best is that, yes, you have one team per operational boundary. And I didn't talk about that in this session, but it's actually very important uh, from a motivational perspective and from a long-term perspective that you as a team get the chance to take personal ownership over something. And uh, the knowledge boundaries, uh, what I mean by that is simply that those are the other parts of the system, that you're not, your team is, aren't owning those parts, but you're familiar with the code. You know a little bit about operations. You have seen the code. You, in particular, you know the people on the other teams. You know who to talk to. I think this is really, really important. So even if you don't need to coordinate in the code, you still want to communicate with other teams. So I hope I managed to clarify that. Sure. Um, so uh, I think we are done with the questions here. There's one more. Yeah, a lot of thank. So a lot of thank you notes for you, Adam. So thanks, Adam, for sharing your experience with us today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, it's Adam. Not for everyone. Experience.